Here's Allegra. Hi, Allegra. Allegra, you look tired. I am tired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard there was school one year. Meeting last night. Yeah. Oh, I think there was a meeting last night. <laughs> there was a long meeting last night, and uh, it's just, it's, it's, I feel like it's been a week. I feel like most weeks have been weeks at this point, but <laughs> like the end of yeah. the year, there's a lot of stuff happening. And as my son keeps on counting down, he said, there are only three full days left of school. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Is that good? Then will you have them all summer and do you have things to do with them or do they have things to do with themselves? They, yeah, he will be at camp at the school and then she's still in daycare. So at least uh, summer, okay. is, summer is accounted for. So okay. welcome Grover and Gaston. Grover and Gaston, hello. Hi. Hi, Hi everyone. Hello. I'm finishing up some dinner, so I'm going to be off camera for a minute, but I'm here. Okay. So what do we need? One more for quorum? Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. No, five. We're we're, yeah, we're only, um, we made it. Okay, but we're like, yeah. uh, I think we're expecting Rob at least, right? Yes, and I believe Rob's going to join us. Paul will not. Paul won't. Well, let's wait a couple few more minutes for Rob before we start. And was there somebody new appointed? Did I read that in the town? Or is that, are we are we getting into meeting <laughs> topic territory and I should be quiet? Yes, um, I, will, I will give an update. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Allegra, you definitely have the in on information. <laughs> oh, there's Rob. And here's Rob. So... Uh, I believe that we are all present and accounted for, knowing that, um, oh my God, our town manager isn't coming. <laughs> so I'm going to call the meeting to order at 7.03, and we'll begin with um, reviewing the minutes. Greg will again be our note taker. The minutes went out with the... Um, packet of stuff. Does anybody have any comments or questions about the minutes? Hearing none, unseeing no hands or other sort of signals, um, I will assume that the minutes have been accepted as presented. <clears throat> Um, and we'll move on to the, well, the first thing I want to do is just to say, so that people at the moment, there are two attendees, Grace Simons from Rep Dom's office and Maura Keene. And maybe we'll update that if it changes a lot. It kind of seems like it's nice when I'm an attendee, it would be nice to have some idea who else is there. So I thought I'd try to do something about that. <clears throat> uh, so the next thing we are going to do, and hopefully if we need him to, Greg can share his screen with the um, notes that he has from people's thoughts about what we should say, what we should write to um, <clears throat> Paul and Dave to ask them to ask you math. Uh, would people like that up on the screen? Anybody have an opinion? I got one head shake. Yes, yes. So, Greg, can you do that for us, please? <clears throat> uh, I think we, or at least I, need it to be bigger. That's Can't better. <laughs> and then we want whatever, wherever it is that the questions are, Okay. 
not exactly sure if I don't have a good idea about how to approach this. If someone else does, maybe <clears throat> um, we can just look through. Are there things in this current snapshot that anybody thinks are partic is particularly important or maybe not important? If there's anything here that looks particularly important or not important, I guess that might be what we want to hear most or first, or do I, are there any comments? I mean, the, the, that snapshot seems to be really the basics. So, and not, not an onerous request. Yeah. Um, that seems, I, I would, I would agree. Does anybody, anybody have any of the way that this is now, it might be hard for me to hear it, see when somebody raises their hand. Cause I can't see everybody and also see Greg's screen. So please feel free to just start talking. And if that, becomes a problem, then we'll deal with it. <clears throat> so just a point of clarification. Um, Gaston, are you saying we should uh, just submit to Dave and Paul the first five bullets and start there? Well, uh, uh, so I was answering the question whether those five bullets under current snapshot seem like good questions. And so whether they're good questions for UMass or someone else who can answer them, uh, but they all seem very basic and important to know if we don't have that information before us. Thank you. Is that what you are wanting to know, Erica? Yes. Okay. And then there are obviously some other set, other areas of questions here. So student resources and <clears throat> consumer experience What's the current process for a student who needs a place to live but can't find one, afford one? What funds are available for emergency housing? <clears throat> um, those also seem like good questions. I, I'm not sure. Um, does anybody have an uh, I see a hand, Grover. Can't hear. Yeah, there you go. I, I was just raising my hand for a little cl clarification about by saying that the summary questions were okay and i agree with gaston gaston basic um i just wanted to be sure we weren't deciding that those were like say the top the five questions that were going to be asked right we're just going through it piece by piece we're just going through it piece by piece at the, for now and when we have when we've done that i forget how many pieces there are right now but when we've done that maybe we will go back and um see if we want to see which ones seem like the most important ones to start with or see if there's some organizing principle here that doesn't appear in these little categories. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so does anybody have anything to add or subtract from the student resources and consumer experience? I'm not sure that these, I, I think this was Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but this was Greg trying to organize our thoughts a little bit for us and put them in categories. There's nothing sacrosanct about the categories either, I don't believe. <clears throat> but is there anything in there that looks like we either, anything that looks profoundly missing or profoundly, we don't really need it? Well, I just wanted to say um, the section under student research and consumer experience, I, to me, those two questions really, the way I feel has an impact on the work we're doing is, is that but um, if they do not have a response for this or any preparation for this, it has an impact on unhoused students. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, I think it's student resources, but I'm not sure it's a consumer experience. I think it's student resources and the potential for being unhoused in Amherst. Um, I actually know of a case at UMass where a student uh, at the end of the semester had nowhere to go and they brought him to a shelter. So um, I think, you know, it's really important that we also understand, do they have uh, capacity to support students or, you know, is the alternative, if there is no way for the student to afford having housing on campus, they just send them to a shelter. And if that's the case, that puts more pressure on the shelter system. Is that, do you feel like that first bullet asks that question or is it too vague? I mean, because more directly, it would seem to me, does the university have 
the capacity to assist students who need blah blah blah. Yeah. I this seems like I don't know. Because the answer to this could be, oh well, we send them to I don't know. It could be a lot of I would change that question to be more direct if that's what it's supposed to be asking. Well, we can add a question or what, you know, we're not actually asking the question. So I imagine the town staff will change them up a bit. But uh, Erica, I, I wrote the question and I presume that what you describe is what their system is, right? Um, and I kind of just want them to say it out loud and also sort of reveal, reveal the missing steps. Does that make sense? Like, because do they even have like a person that they contact who, like who would be the person that a student will contact if they're having a housing uh, crisis, for example, that's even a step before we drive a child, uh, a student to the shelter. Right. So, but we could ask it more directly. Do you have a plan for students who are about to experience homelessness? I mean, we also know that the answer is usually no, just because of what's been happening the last couple of years. I, if, if I may just insert, like the phrasing a question as do you have a plan or, or a process offers up the opportunity to say, yes, we have a process, period, <laughs> you know, or versus should... like as currently written, what is the process? Okay. Okay. I don't want to get lost in the words of it. That's fine. <clears throat> I accept your, your, what you're saying. Yep. Um, and then, I was just going to say, I'll tell you the process is, is that the students will work with the Dean of Students Office and that's the process. But um, I think, you know, asking about the specific process of, you know, when there is no, no resolution, then what? Yeah. So, so then um, if we look at the next part, which is process, which has more questions in it, uh, thoughts about that part? I have a question and I apologize for not like, contributing to this document at all, but I'm wondering if there would be a question and where it would go about what kind of tracking the university has for people who are living off campus. Like, is there a directory of students and where they live off campus and, and what kind of supports those students? Oh, okay. Student resources, can you, do you want to stick something in there? I don't yeah, think I, mean, I, I guess I kind of to piggyback off of the one under the the that under that piece, maybe under student resources, what what support is available from the university to off campus students, or I and I don't know if maybe if if the student resources are talking about anybody who needs a place to live or needs a place to live on campus or off campus or if we're intentionally leaving the door open for whatever the answer might be. Hmm, Grover? Well, you remember when UMass staff came and talked to us? I thought they answered already the question about if they track off-campus students. And I don't believe they do track where they're living at all. It, they just, track who's on campus and assume everybody else is off yeah i think that's probably right yeah um i guess we can ask i guess that one of the things we need to do unless we're going to send this whole thing as a laundry list to to dave and paul is to figure out what are the really important things that we would be sure to want to find out and we look at the last part of this, the horizons part, and then having kind of had a chance to remember what's here or look at it again, 
maybe we would then, maybe we would then see what yes please maybe then we would see if we look at that last this last part horizon thing um then maybe there are things here that are what we want to lead with and what seems most important and um so Any thoughts, anyone? Gaston. Yeah, um, I think that on the um, the category of questions under process, I'm not sure that, I, I guess I would suggest maybe dropping the first question about where the money goes, because I don't know if we want to get inside of their budgeting and how um, pertinent is from our point of view. Um, and I guess I, I wonder what was the thought behind the question about the all state housing rules? If Is there a specific question there that we're curious about? Um, I had posed that question in green and I, I think I would drop it because the prior question in orange gets at, I think the the key part of that question that is a friendlier question to ask. Yeah, okay. Uh, so you are suggesting dropping the first one and also the... The, the third one, I'm just wondering what, yeah. what was the thought behind that question? I guess my instinct or my my immediate reaction is let's ask about what policy we're concerned with unless there's a thought there that, that I'm missing. Uh, does whoever wrote that want to respond to that? Or their yeah, state? That's me. Okay. Yeah, the third question uh, is there because um, how do I say? I feel like the town and advocates and people in the town have been going round and round and round with like bits and pieces of information from the university for a long time. And one of the things that isn't clear to me in any document or information that we have is the actual decision making process that the university has about their responsibility, funding and duty for housing. And so it seems to me very likely that uh, local student advocates might spend an entire year trying to get the chancellor to commit to X, Y, Z, only to have them say, well, the, the broader UMass housing policy that's decided by the board of governors is this. So in terms of how university systems work, knowing, like I come from the University of North Carolina system, and knowing that Campus activism can go so far, but really the decision makers are a different body that's not even necessarily located in this town. And so if that's so, I would like that clarified on the front end so that because a lot of like people listening to this meeting or following this work don't have access to those conversations that the town manager will be having with the university. That makes sense. Well, um, Gaston, does that answer your concern? Yeah, I guess maybe I, I um, maybe the last the or does the provost set these policies? Um, because I guess if it is local, then it's the chancellor, right? Um, but you you want to know what are the what are the statewide policies that are controlling in Amherst? Yes, and I actually was going to ask to edit that because as I was reviewing it before the meeting, I was like, mm, I think that's the wrong title, so. Yeah, but we can admit that. Or like, does the does UMass Amherst set the policy is, is one way we could phrase that. Do you set the policies or are there are they statewide set? Yeah. Okay. Um Greg, are you making note of the suggested changes as we go? I mean, yes. you don't have to do it on here, but are you doing it somewhere? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, let's move to the last section called 
that is called Horizon, which I guess is about the future. That's why it's Horizon. <clears throat> what about these questions? Well, it looks like maybe we can consolidate some of it. Yeah, I I hope so. I hope so. That's, I mean, I think if we, I would hope that after we talk about this like this, we have some sense, and if we come back, there's nothing here, or we threw out maybe one or two things, but if these things make sense, we can try now to consolidate some of it, or one of my thoughts is that we can ask for someone to actually draft something that is a more like a letter and less like a laundry list. And we will now and we will still get a chance right now to say, so what are the things that seem like the highest priorities after looking at all of this? Are there things that jump out as this is the thing we most need to know? Or do we just need to know all of this? I mean, I whatever. So so yeah. I want to offer dropping the last bullet, which was mine, um, because I think it really doesn't fit. I mean, it's, it's about what UMass can do for the community and community engagement, but it doesn't really fit with the higher priorities. So I would suggest, since it was mine, to drop the last bullet. Okay. I mean, it, am I? it kind of seems like the horizon questions are really variations on the theme of what are the future plans for building and renovating housing and compare that to enrollment and what kind of unused land is available and would you mass consider building on it um, in various ways that the community can also benefit from i don't know if if those two kind of longer questions would kind of capture most of what's written there. Or what consideration is made with regards to the impact on the community. Mm -hmm. Allegra, would you be interested in trying to draft that the way that you just said it instead of the way that it is here? I can try and do that, yeah. That would be great. And then get it, I guess, to Greg. I'm hoping that we will come back next time with an actual draft of a letter that we can agree to send. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Yes. OK. Yes. So we yeah, have and then we can also work out of that. What? Um, sorry, go on. <laughs> I, I, I missed somebody said something I didn't hear because I think I was probably trying to talk at the same time. I see Gaston has a hand up. Oh, th uh, thanks. I, I just know one of these questions in Horizon is is also above, so it can be dropped from one of them. And I I, I hundred percent agree with um, with Allegra's comments um, that there's consolidation available here. The um, the question it's not so much Horizon, but it would go earlier that. I don't that we don't have. I wonder if if you all think it's it's important to know what are the standard housing assistance programs they are offering faculty and staff. Uh, maybe that goes up with where we were asking about what the processes yeah, yeah. are. Yep. <clears throat> Is there anybody who feels like they would like to take one of these other parts or? two of these other parts, if we had like a short paragraph almost for each one of these things, I guess that could still be bullets, but I would think that would be a step in the right direction. And and I don't know, it doesn't for me, at least not in the, my current state of brain space, <clears throat> nothing here is jumping out as this is what we absolutely must know, except for maybe the, the future looking ones what are you willing to build and how does it compare to what you think your student body is going to be? That's, that's, that might, that's probably my main thing I'd like to know, which is kind of in what Allegra was just talking about. She's going to draft Grover. Well, I, so I, I totally support and appreciate anyone willing to go in and consolidate the sections a bit, but I, 
wouldn't want I don't want us to spend too much time thinking about like the one question or the two questions to ask because we asked for their bodies to meet with us and instead of it the town manager and staff are asking for us to have our questions go through them so these are our questions right like the ones that aren't duplicitous these are the questions we would ask if they came into a meeting so I, I feel like we should feel empowered to leave them. Okay. Anybody else have a thought about that? I agree with that. That that makes sense. I, I don't think it will matter necessarily. I think a list is fine. Okay. Mm. All right. You know, Greg. Could, could I, Carol, if, you know, I, I, I think there's there's a lot of value in, in Grover's observation there. And then also, Carol, I think part of, I think what I heard you getting at was like what do we want them to do you know like like what like besides give us information in response to these questions right i think there's there's a there's perhaps a sort of like intended outcome piece of this and i think your points like we want them to participate you know and and <laughs> with you know with capital resources you know in, in housing solutions either for their students or for low-income people in town or both you know um I mean, so I think the different things get at different sort of like what, you know, we, we want them to like be real about like what happens when, when a student is vulnerable to homelessness, you know? Um, and then I think also the, 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 the projection thing, like we want them to name, you know, what their expected enrollment is going to be. And to me, what, like, that is sharing data at a point. So it's passive in that sense, but that in turn, I would love to be able to get to a place where, you know, especially if, if we can, if they're sharing proactively, we think in two years, it's going to be this number, then we could maybe eventually get to a place where we could say, Hey, we think that number will drive this much need in town, you know? And so that's the unmet need that we just introduced in the past 18 months or whatever. Um, so yeah, sorry, I guess I'm maybe just summarizing, but. Um... Well, um, if we, apparently we've got at least two people who liked Grover's suggestion of leave it mostly as it is, except for taking out the things that are duplicative. Uh, I guess I'll see what Grover, um, what Gaston wants to say first and then see if we can wrap this up. Thanks. So I guess I'm a little confused whether this, set of questions however we present them is going straight to umass or is going to the town manager to kind of ask on our behalf if it's going it's going to the town manager yeah. and the assistant town manager yeah. and they're going to do whatever they do with it yeah so. and i i 100 agree like give them a set of questions and then they've got them in front of them and can use them in a live dialogue and collect um what i'm seeing that we don't really ask about and i wonder if you all think we should is you know, what is your vision for addressing the 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 pressure on housing in the Amherst area? What what would you like from the town? Um, I'd be curious to kind of hear them tell us what they would like and what how they think all of this can sort itself out. Anybody object to adding that kind of a question? Nope, I think it's a good question. Okay. Well then, I think I guess that the only the main question now is do we have enough agreement here to direct uh Erica and I with the vast help from Greg and a rewrite from Allegra? Do we have what we need here to direct us to go and write the letter or does everyone want to look at it again after we do all that? That's my question which is not a yes or no question, is it? So what does anybody think? Maybe have an opinion. I support your judgment after the edits are made to submit them. Okay. Uh, how many people agree with Grover? Let's do thumbs or something that we can, or raising hands or any objections. Anybody have a problem with this approach? Okay. So then Greg will collect his edits from what we've talked about. We'll get Allegra's rewrite of this horizon part. And then um, Greg will get all that to 
Eric and I, and we will draft a letter to Paul and Dave and send it off and send you all a copy. All agreed. I think I just repeated what we already agreed to, but anyway. Uh, okay, then moving along. Nate's not here yet, is he? Is he Greg? Is he coming? You said. Um, my understanding was he had planned to dial in. Maybe he was going to be remote at a place where he didn't have a computer or something. Um, but I don't see him here yet. But I can. Um, because uh, I think I can, this I can, a thumbnail, or we can. Um, I don't think I want to. I'm not sure I want to do. Well, we can do whatever we want. Um, and all what we were going to get from Greg was kind of his take on where he want what he wanted from us in trying to do um, the overlay draft because I don't I think that he's I'll let Greg say what he knows about what Nate thinks and maybe sure, Nate yeah. will get here. Yeah, and, and he, you know, knowing the way life works, he'll probably show up in like twelve seconds. But um, uh, yeah, so the the status with the housing overlay for University Drive, which is something we discussed, I believe, two or three months ago in this monthly meeting, um, that is still with the planning board. Um, but they are, I understand, uh, maybe I think that the last best estimate I heard is one or two meetings away, perhaps, from making a. I guess it would be a, there's a phrase for it, but like a formal recommendation of a zoning amendment to council. Um, the town council would then consider that recommendation. Um, and then I guess send it back down to the planning board, pr presuming the council was amenable to it. I think they would send it back down to the planning board for, for a second reading and further consideration. And it was Nate's thought that perhaps the best time for the trust to weigh in would be at that second reading at the planning board, which I think the current best guess is maybe August or September is when that would happen, that when that would get back to them. Um, and I think the thinking behind waiting was that it would be perhaps a little more crafted at that point, And there might be some more specifics to respond to in favor of or in opposition to. Um, that's the summary. I'm going to give a quick good night hug here. Pardon me. <laughs> yes, we <please> do. <laughs> yeah, so I think that what that means basically is that uh, we don't need to do anything about it right now. I, I went to the planning board meeting where they were talking about it, about it some, and it was kind of, it was kind of very all over the place. Nate had, Nate had felt like they were getting closer to making it something that would not, he was worried it would have so many bells and whistles that they would put into the overlay that would never be used because it was just too complicated. And um, I think he thinks they are getting closer, but at least when I heard the meeting, I wasn't so convinced of that. Uh, but anyway, he, he who knows more about that all, how that all stuff works certainly than I do, does seem to suggest that we don't have to do anything right now, but if I expect that it will keep coming up the planning board, if anybody wants to go listen to it, it's certainly uh, something we can do. Does anybody have any thoughts, other thoughts or comments? I'm sorry, Nate's not here to more speak for himself, but <clears throat> I'm sure when he shows up, he'll say whatever he wants. I was just going to add um, that I think, you know, uh, Nate's idea probably is, um, in my experience with the town council is such diversity and experience that they will raise what some of Nate's concerns, which is that if it's so um, specific and descriptive, why do this in, instead of just using the zoning um, bylaws? So I think it would provide a good opportunity for town council members to weigh in. And then once there's that draft, then it's a good opportunity for us to weigh in very specifically on the impact of that on affordable housing. Yeah, and that, that's, that's probably, that's probably a good idea. And so, and besides, it means we don't have to do anything right now. <laughs> uh, so does anyone have anything else that they would like to say about uh, 
the overlay, the, the possible overlay zoning change. Uh, then let us move on to the review and discussion of the inclusionary zoning language. Maybe Greg can put it on the screen. I know Gaston had a thought about it that he emailed earlier, so maybe he can share that. But do you want to put it up, Greg, so we can have it in front of us while we talk about it? There, that's it, right? <laughs> so I believe that the change is, I thought it was just an addition of a, except that the granting fee and lieu for each affordable unit shall be four times. I thought it was just gonna be four times at least four times. So I think the, the addition here is, um, is so it basically uh, everything in this proposal, which which is I think the earlier one, but everything is as it was. And then this addition here is, except that the permit granting board can can adjust this. Um, here it, re it just reads passively adjust. It doesn't say up or down. Um, so it's basically saying, you know, the permit granting authority can can modify, you know, per its its prerogatives. Um, and I think we heard, yeah, we heard from Gaston uh, today with an idea. And then, and Rob, um, did you want to uh, weigh, weigh in? You you had shared a, a thought a while back. Yep, if I can. Yes, please. So um, I don't think this is a good idea the way it's written um, because. This so right now the 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 fee lieu is required to be four times AMI. This invites a developer to request a lower number, and that is what's going to happen every single time. So so you know this is a step backward in my yeah, I kind of agree with that. I thought I didn't look at this recently enough, obviously, I would just thought I was just going to say unit shall be at least four times. So it makes this a minimum instead of an absolute amount. That's what I'm in. I'm in favor of that, but not exactly this, but Allegra. My two changes would be at least four times the current amount. And then under special permit granting authority may instead of adjust, I would say increase the fee in lieu of so that we're not backpedaling to say, no, we'll pay less than three or less than four. Those would be my suggestions. Other thoughts? Gaston? Yeah, I mean, my, my thought is that it should be kind of rewritten instead of just trying to tack this on because um, there's the problem that Rod spotted but also if you're in this permit granting board this is not really giving you much guidance and i would think that if we have it as such you're going to get members feeling the same way they felt this last time that it's not really our place to be messing with this number and so that's why my thought was to um maybe give a range and the high end of the range can be, you know, on the high end. Um, but then the question for the board or authority is kind of where to land it in that range, given these factors that are given importance. And so that's why my, my question to, um, to, to, to Nate and Greg was, what was in effect the, you know, I think Nate had a sense of what kind of number the town was looking for what what multiple would that have been in, in the case that we looked at on pleasant street and that would give us a sense of maybe what the kind of range is that um is a uh, is appropriate here and and so then um it's more that the fee in lieu 
shall be set by the permit granting board or special permit granting authority and shall be within this range. So that, you know, indicating that they have to decide it and it should be within the range or above this minimum. I think I like that. I think I like that idea. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't interrupt myself for a second. Uh, but keep talking. Hello. I had my hand up. I don't know if anyone else does because I'm on a phone. No. Yeah. You're, you're the only one. Go ahead, Grover. Okay. Um, I like the spirit of that suggestion, but in terms of practice and policy writing, I would not support putting any real concrete numbers or ranges in here because there's a possibility that it might not get updated for 10 or 20 years. And then you end up with a situation where it's doing the opposite and people are holding, holding solid to that range. It sets, it potentially could set a new norm that goes below. So if anything, um, I, I agree with Allegra's suggestion and the other edit suggest and Rob's suggestion. And from what I'm, I'd be curious to hear why it was rewritten this way. Cause the initial edits we saw a couple months ago read in a way that I thought was clearer. So if this was changed in the ZBA or planning, or if this is just staff writing, I'd be, no, it's just staff writing. Um, anyway, so I would be curious to hear more about that process and why this particular language was chosen because I remember um, I remember the conversation being that um, he thought that that so that we could be asking for more. And so if anything, we I would if we were gonna look for more, I would support changing the number four times to five times or something, right? Like adjusting that. Um, so I can understand, Grover, you're saying you'd rather change it to a fixed amount that's higher and instead of saying a minimum of this? No, I, I would support. The The real truth is that I would support saying. Um, changing it to the or higher and. I would not support putting any dollar number in there at all that I think it should stay proportionate to market conditions and also be variable by the deciding body based on the location needs things like that but I'm actually remembering now that um that he said um I think it's actually that he thought we could get more affordable units built by the inclusionary number than the in lieu of number. So I retract my comment about changing four to five, but in general um, would not want to put a dollar amount in there. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so we could put for shall be at least four times that still seems to work is there anybody that that at least that little part of it doesn't work for if we just have that however it is it's at least four times and then we're still talking about where who in the world it is who decides this goes but does that work i see gaston's hand yeah, I, uh, I i yeah i think i mean i think we all agree that that four four times is the minimum the the I guess the point that I'm raising is to try to look at this from the standpoint of whichever board is in the position to have to come up with a number. And if it's just the minimum, one way, you know, a conservative member of the board is going to feel like, well, okay, maybe we'll go a little bit up, like a, per, a per couple percent higher or something. But the idea that it could be multiples higher and that's endorsed by the uh, by the bylaw. Um, wouldn't be spelled out. And that's why I'm suggesting having 
a high um, multiple be the top? And it's going to vary as the median family income varies. And we can choose an insanely high multiple, but then we're telling whoever decides this, you're looking in that in that range. You're looking in that space for the right number. Uh, I see. So you mean the range not being a dollar range, but more like four to 10 times. Yeah, four, yeah, four to eight uh, or whatever. That's why I was curious what multiple it was that the town was asking. We know that the Pleasant Street is going to be on the high end of, a, a, you know, the kind that would we expect would be very high relative to the typical because it's in the center of town, et cetera. So what was the multiple in that? And then maybe we go a step or two higher than that, but then we know that that's kind of, that's the reasonable accordion here to, to find the right number in there. And so if anything, then the, the signal to the board would be, well, let's let's go to the middle of that range or something like that. And then there we, we can have a negotiation, but the negotiation is in that space that we're comfortable with. Um, other thoughts, Grover, I just, does that, does that, uh, resolve your issue with having dollars in there okay so we could say four to ten times or something or other the shall be four to ten times or four to something or other i don't i don't I, know I what makes sense <laughs> if, 10 if, seems a lot high so i don't know if, if if i may i i would i would then i think it should be then rewritten instead of using the construction I, that was written for having a set multiple that this whoever the authority is decides what the number is and that number has to be in the range as opposed to having it in the current order i like i like that too because it assigns the responsibility in a way that this sort of leaves a little bit floppy so if it says that in lieu of each uh it will will be set by the blah 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 and will be between four and something or other times the area median income. How does that sound? I got a thumbs up from Allegra. Anybody want a thumbs up from Grover, Rob? Does that sound does that sound like where we're at? The only thing we need to do is what's four to what? What's the other number in that case? Anybody have I, mean, I'd I might be curious ask for Rob Nate to say, or oh, yeah, oh, sorry. I I was going to ask Rob from having been on these kinds of boards before, if you have any thoughts for us. Um. So th this the way this is going is is I think helpful to the board, um, because you know for the reason that that's what I was saying, it, it does give them direction and and a range to help. Um. The the. The I, I don't think the range needs to be very big, like four to six maybe is is enough. Um, and, and even you know, because I can't imagine that six would ever be, that would be a lot. Um, I'm sorry, which lot? would be a lot? Six, six times. Six. I mean, that's yeah. Even, even as it is, four times is a lot. But but you know, as we were saying, in some cases, it it should be higher. Um, so I think that's that's a. a Four to six to seems it. four to six seems maybe reasonable. Mm -hmm. Greg. Yeah, I was just gonna sort of come back and answer Gaston's questions and and, and also I guess speak to Rob's point. Um I pretty sure and, and I think they just boiled it into a uh, a cash number and not a, a a multiplier. But I think doing this sort of back and envelope math in my head from what I recall that cash number being I think he recommended like six or 6.5 to okay. the, I mean, yeah. Cause I think it was like, I think, I think what they ended up going, I forget what he discussed sort of with the developer and then what it, it was, I think, you know, I think we ended up doing 1.2 or whatever the statute said. I'm pretty sure at one point there was a talk of 1.8 and then maybe there was a formal recommendation of 1.5 and that was for three units. So I think the multiplier they ended up recommending was somewhere around six, I think. So I don't, I mean, I, you know, I, six might 
if we're, if we're talking about a longer period of time and, you know, and, and, and Grover made the good point that as basically happened here, numbers can change drastically in 20 years, you know, as far as how these things get fed, you know, it, it, you know, a, a wider range might be a little safer. Grover. Yeah, I was gonna say the similar thing because we don't really know what's gonna happen one with incoming inequality and to the housing market. Um, so yeah, I would recommend a wider range and you you don't have to choose the range, right? Like based on the back of the napkin math. Um, and yeah, it could be a negotiation. So I would recommend closer I mean, I was just throwing 10 out there, but honestly, like, if six was what we got with no policy, um, the outcome with no policy, as Greg's saying, which isn't my memory of it, um, I thought they just went with the base. They map. did. Okay. The, 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 the actual final deal, based on what the board's preference was, what was what's written currently in the bylaw, which is four times yeah. but the recommendation that staff made I, I believe was around six times um mfi right so so i would i would say but well, we can propose it and the next board can shoot it down but something more like nine or even ten to make room for if something really merits that you know Other thoughts? I mean, I would just say as 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 high as as the town staff thinks passes the smell test, maybe maybe it's eight. Um, I don't know. You're saying let the town uh, town staff figure come up with that number? Is that what you're suggesting? I I mean, I guess to evaluate what what seems to pa pass the not not seem absurd too absurd to uh developers um uh but to be actually kind of challenging that they're gonna have to make the case why they want to be on the lower end of that range allegra um i kind of am gonna echo grover i kind of like the idea of 10 because then that makes six look like a deal <laughs> if you're if you're going for the lower end, then you can push the lower end up by making the higher end really untenable. Um, that's those are just my thoughts. Thank you. And oh. I was just going to say uh, that um, they can always choose to build the uh, units versus paying. Um, so if to them, it's it's outrageous. They can always choose to build those units. So it's not as if they are forced to pay in lieu of. Uh, and we still win one way or the other uh, in terms of affordable units. Um, and, and the other thing I just want to say is whatever language we use, we still include that whatever that range is, is based on market conditions, unit sizes, project location, and similar or uh, relevant factors. Oh, okay. I see. So, so it would say something like the permitting board will determine the in lieu of amount based on market conditions, unit sizes, project location, and similar factors. And the amount will be between, will that amount will be between four and X. <laughs> times the median family income for the for the region is that where we are and the question is whether x is going x and x seems like it's going to be oh the numbers that i've heard somewhere between six and ten it's not going to be less than six and we got a bunch of arguments for ten and i honestly don't have a strong i think it should be more than six that's all that's as far as i can get so uh and i know i'm that fine with 10 Grover i'm just saying yeah what? i'm fine i'm fine with 10 if, if if it gets if the town council will pass it that's fine with me <laughs> well let's put 10 in i mean anybody can somebody can reduce it if they want to but is there anybody who objects to it being 10 and I, I don't it, object to, go ahead i don't object to 10 i, I just 
if if the if the town staff is going to be providing a recommendation about what the multiplier should be, then then I think ten is fine. But if you're going to leave it up to the planning board to to guess what the multiplier should be at, at any given point, having too wide a range is going to be too difficult for, the, for them to handle. I just think so. So that's why I'm suggesting a narrower range. But if the if town staff is going to be actively involved in this, which I assume they will be, then ten is fine. Okay. Uh, so we seem to be at four to 10 with the rewrite that I just suggested. That is a, hopefully a compilation of what everyone else has said. And hopefully Greg is writing that down. Greg's got it. Okay. I believe Erica has Carol. something else to say, and then I hope we're done. I see that Shelly's here. Is that yes. what? Um, so do we need, and just based on what Rob just said, do we need to have language that says that the town staff will make an analysis and make a recommendation uh, for the range based on location, market conditions, et cetera? So it actually writes in that the town staff does the analysis. Uh, I don't know that that, say what you were saying again, Rob. Um, I, I don't think that's necessary. I think, I think um, if 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 this is if the planning board presents this to the council, <clears throat> staff will be asked for their um, recommendation about it, they, and presumably they will say, "Yes, we support this because we will be supporting whatever proposal comes forward." So, I, I don't think it's necessary. Thanks, Rob. Uh, any further questions? Have we got a draft here of what we're thinking about, or we have at least a way to write it? Okay, I believe that we are done then with that. I see that Shelly is here or was here. She just disappeared for a second anyways. And I will now turn the meeting over to Erica to take us through the rest of what we wanna do. Thank you for your screen sharing. Greg, and thanks everybody for your input. Thank you. Um, and uh, Greg, if you could actually put up goal one of three. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Shelly. But before we do, I just want to say that um, our small group has been meeting, which has been Rob, Carol, myself, Greg, yeah. and Shelly has been exactly. leading it. Oops, sorry, is an echo for me. Um, and so we've been meeting um, sometimes twice a month just to try to put this together and present it back to you. So we feel strongly that um, we're at a point with the first goal and strategies uh, strong enough to be able to bring it back to this group for feedback. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Shelly. And I just want to thank Shelly for really the patience and the expertise that she shares with us and um, just the leadership that she's providing to us to get this action plan um, move, moving forward. So go ahead, Shelly. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that Greg is going to share a screen in a minute. So uh, you've seen the three goals and we've really just been, we've been working on all of them, but we've spent the most time on the first goal, which is development. So to remind you, this goal is to support the creation there at the top, support the creation of 200 homes affordable to people earning below 100% of the area median income over the next five years. So that's the goal that we've already looked at and we've come to agreement. And then we've been digging in to come up with some strategies to help you work towards meeting that goal. Um, so we have A through E. So we're going to go through each of these and provide some time for conversation and feedback. And then there are a couple points down below that had been talked about at, at one of our full meetings. And we're making the recommendation that these not be in the strategy specifically, but that they go to the guidelines and that we spend a little bit of time after we're done creating the strategy goals and strategies, we spend a little bit of time updating your trust guidelines and trying to make it a document that feels useful to use um, because you do have it, but it, I'm not, it sounds like you don't use it so much. So we're hoping that we can make it a little bit more, um, a document that you will turn to a little bit more. So um, I, I will go through each of these just so that Carol and Erica, so everyone can be, you all can be participants and, and, so that's that's just why I'm doing this versus Erica or Carol. 
So the first strategy to help you reach these 200 units is to identify two parcels in collaboration with the town to use for affordable housing development. So the reason that we wrote it this way is making sure that we want to do it with the town, but not necessarily holding you to just municipal sites in case you, there aren't two appropriate municipal sites at this point. So we left it more broad where it's not just specifically municipal, but it could be like the project that you've done with the town. Um, I'm forgetting what the address is, but where you've acquired a, a site. Um, the VFW uh, hall. It wasn't there a parcel on a, um, I don't know if it. Yeah. Something that you've like in the last couple of years that you've acquired the, the private. Yeah, this, this is the, the, what is now the wayfinders development that emerged from the East street school site. And then yeah. is also paired with the Belcher town road site. Belcher town. Yes. Yeah. So we left it general where it's two sites, but not necessarily municipal, but it could be, but not necessarily, but really wanting it to be in collaboration with the town. So that's the first strategy. Do you want to do go through all five and then have conversation, or would you like to have conversation after each one? How are people feeling? What what makes sense to you? So why don't I start by just going through all five and then we'll do some discussion. So the second one is which stemmed from our conversation about UMass, our extensive conversation about UMass in particular, was to seek a land donation from a local educational institution for affordable housing development. So we decided not to just specify UMass to leave it more broad, that it could be any um, educational institution. And we also tried to write it in a way that it's not necessarily that the land would be necessarily donated to the town. It could be that it's donated to um, Wayfinders or Valley CDC, but that the trust would be actively engaged in encouraging, um, supporting, helping to perhaps even facilitate a land donation from an educational institution. The third, because there's some sensitivity to helping to create home ownership opportunities, is to support the creation of 20 homes for ownership. So leaving it somewhat broad about how that would be done, but just naming 20 home ownership units. The fourth is to work with the town to create a path for non-conforming lots to be used as affordable housing development. So it was brought up that there are perhaps quite a few parcels in town that are at this point under current zoning, non-conforming for home develop for um, housing development. But based on historic development patterns, um, many houses sit on lots that are that size, that small. So how do you work towards a way to, to redevelop these lots into affordable housing? And then the fifth is to explore the possibility of establishing a revolving loan fund to support small new construction of affordable housing for converting existing buildings to affordable housing in the size of kind of 12 units and below. So smaller kind of developments. This is probably the, um, the least measurable, but there was an interest in, in the, just in some of the language that you all have used is that there seems to be some interest in um, exploring new tools or things that you haven't done yet, being a little bit perhaps innovative. And so we had an interest of putting a strategy in that would stretch you a little bit, that would help you learn and to explore something that, that doesn't currently exist in Amherst. So those are the five that we've settled on at this point that we were wanting to present to you. And then the couple things that we've put in suggested for the guidelines is um, some additional language around having a particular interest in supporting innovative solutions. So it's sending a um, kind of a message to people who may apply for your funds that you're interested in exploring, as I said, like things that don't necessarily, some, you, you do have a land trust, but that you're interested in supporting models that aren't necessarily just kind of more traditional affordable housing models. And then possibly adding to your criteria uh, that some language around that proposals that include a mix of affordability, 30% to 100% will be highly rated. So it's come up before in different conversations of um, you having an interest of not just 
concentrating um, one income level, but really having an interest in supporting mixed income developments. And so the possibility of putting that, adding that to your criteria when you review proposals that you'll rate those that have multiple uh, income levels highly, more high, higher than those that are just one income level. So at this point we're proposing the A through E and would love to open it up to some conversation about how you're feeling. And of course, this is all to help you get to 200 new affordable homes for people earning um, below 100% AMI in the next five years. Allegra? I guess my question is just clarifying whether all of the units that we already have in the pipeline as of right now are included in that 200 or is this additional to what we already have? Additional. Okay, oh, thank you. And I like the ideas. Um, Grover? Question, and I know that you intentionally said whatever means, whatever means, but the term in point C, support the creation of 20 homes for ownership, mm -hmm. is that above and beyond like providing our funding for a land trust purchase, for example? So is, it, is it fresh build or? No, so creation could be that it's taking a, that it's the land trust is buying a market rate house and adding a restriction so that the restriction could be creating. So Great. that could absolutely be part of the 20. And that was intentional in our conversation that that part of the 20 could be supporting, as you have in the past, the, the land trust and acquiring more units. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Gaston has his hand yeah. up. Sure, yeah. thank right. you. Um, yeah, um, uh, I guess, Following Grover's point, I wonder if the way to get at the spirit there is to actually talk about creating home owners, um, tw 20 home owners or something, um, because there might be different ways of, of, of getting that it might not involve creating a new home to create a homeowner. Um, that's just a, a thought there. The, the comment I did want to make was, um, I'm happy that the ADUs is included in those guidelines. And I wonder if, uh, if if the trust might consider including the ADUs as an alternative way of um, uh, deploying that letter E, that the, the small new construction uh, might include ADUs as a form, in, you know, uh, in addition to conversions. I could. So I, some of the conversation of, of not naming ADUs yet is because the um, the housing bond bill is it's looking good that the ADU ADU language is being kept in. And if it's if it passes and the governor signs that um, ADUs can be um, accepted by right across the state, then it's very likely that there'll be a state funding source as well. So uh, I think some of the interest was to not yet explicitly say ADUs in E and leave it more open. But that that could absolutely be something that um, if there if there were a revolving loan fund that it could be used in that way. The, the issue is that with ADUs is that it would need to be restricted. And to restrict an ADU, um, it takes monitoring and that takes an additional layer of management that may or may not be um, uh, something that that you want to um, invest in. So it, it's not necessarily a slam dunk from an affordable housing perspective. It definitely is a, an advantage or a benefit of just having more diverse housing options and smaller housing options. So it's just, but it's possible. So just to, to make sure I understand, your understanding is that E already is consistent, you know, creating an ADU that is affordable if if those issues you raise or address is completely contemplated in E, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that E, the revolving loan fund, could be used in that manner. Okay. But there's um, like there's some sensitivity to supporting smaller scale developers, developers that maybe don't have the same um, resources as others and smaller developments and converting small existing buildings into affordable housing. And there aren't always 
sufficient resources for that? So could there be uh, a local resource that could help with that? And we'll see, we'll see if it's a if it's an affordable, we're talking about affordable housing. So in order for it to be an affordable unit, there would need to be some kind of affordability restriction on it, which is why it oftentimes gets tied to the home and not just the the home the buyer, the homeowner. Um, because in order for it to be an affordable unit, there needs to be a restriction on it. So it's not just, uh, we're not just talking about a, um, a down payment assistance program, for example. It's it's really, it's more, it's a bigger investment than that. It's really buying a restriction that would be on the home for, depending on the funding source, a, a, a period of time. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different than just home buyer. Grover has a hand up. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I have curiosity about point E. Mm -hmm. Um, one is if we established a revolving loan, well, this is just exploring the possibility of establishing a, a revolving loan fund. So I guess this could be a kick it down, kick the can down the road question, but it raises some bigger questions both operationally and sort of ethically and and in terms of what does it mean for our body to basically hold giant pockets of money sort of in circulation whereas like right now we get money we give it out right we get money we give it out it seems pretty like cut and dried math but then establishing a loan fund just adds a layer of complexity but also then um it's sort of like right now it seems overwhelming because it would potentially never end right um and also then it would make us um it would make some people indebted to us mm -hmm. right and in terms of of interest and things like that i'm not saying i'm opposed to it i think it's interesting especially if it's targeted to smaller um buildings that have a harder time getting funding together mm -hmm. um but it yeah it raises some really big questions and also about um, how the town how much labor and cost that would add to the town for administering it versus mm -hmm. what is right now a pretty simple spreadsheet from what i can see yep so that's really why it's explore because it's it doesn't feel like we're ready to say yes but it really is that we need to consider whether it's feasible. What would it cost? Just what kind of money would you need to get it to do, have, make it make it worthwhile? And um, with small projects like this, even be able to pay it back. Like, is that is that feasible if they're affordable units? And there are some trusts like Somerville where some of their, some of the money that they allocate, they do expect it to be paid back. So it is a repayable loan and for certain funding sources. So for acquisition or for pre-development, they'll expect it to be paid back and it's structured that way. And then they have funds where it's considered a um, 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 like a soft, soft debt where they don't necessarily expect to get it paid back. And certain, if it's more deeply affordable, if the development's more deeply affordable, then that may be more inclined to be forgiven over time. So there are there are potentially models that might work, but it it might not be feasible for this small. So it's something that you need to you need to research a little bit. Carol. Yeah, I just totally agree with all of the problems that Grover just described. Mm -hmm. But the other unstated thing in all of that is it's also make it then be in a way a source of income because it's money that you spend but you get back. So you're not spending it so in the same way as when you put it into something and you never see it again. And what it costs to do the administration, all the things that you said, Grover, but it seems to me that it has the possibility, and that's why it seems worth exploring, of being both a way to support some kinds of developments and a way to keep some of the money in the, in the pot. And what you might come up with is that maybe it's not 
effective with 12 units and below, maybe it's just that you restructure how you allocate some funds now, maybe some you do for some purposes, you do expect it to be paid back with the permanent loan um, and others are forgiven over time. So that could come up in your, in your research. Surprisingly, or at least it was surprising to me when I read through that our whatever it's called that we never use, it said we, it, that it is expected that the money that is spent will be spent as loans. As far as I know, that's never happened, but that's what it said in here. It's just curious. Well, it's typically structured as a loan because then that's where you have um, you have the legal ability to enforce the um, parameters of the loan. If it's just a grant, then it's harder. So with a loan, it's typically would be then filed with the registry. Um, and I think with LIHTC, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, I think there's a reason that they need funds to be loaned, I think. Does it feel at, with these five, the A through E, does it, does, are you thinking of, is anything coming to mind that you think is, is missing? Or do any of these feel not doable in the, we're giving it five years. So it's a, a, I mean, time flies, but. Well, I just noticed that I'm trying to look at it with those eyes. What's not named at all, um, and I'm assuming it's because it's assumed because it's what we've been doing or what is common with affordable housing development, but is funding the creation of affordable rental units. It's just not named. So noting that, um, I don't. It just makes me curious. I don't think we'll stop uh, supporting those developments, but, um, yeah, I, I might value naming it. Mm -hmm. It's funny. Cause I think that for me that because the funding sources are primarily for rental housing, that it seems as if everything's rental unless you name ownership. <laughs> so I think that was kind of my assumption, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, I thought so too, in terms of the 200 homes, I think we didn't want to put units because, so often people just think of structure and we want really people to think about a home regardless if it's rental or home ownership. So I thought the same thing that the 200 was really either rental or home ownership. And that's when we put in specifically 20 for home ownership as a minimum. Yeah, I just, I right. would like us to name it because I would like to, I would like us to break through some of the taboo that like rental is bad and home ownership is good. I, they're all good. All the homes are good. So Maybe 200 rental and home ownership units might resolve it. I so appreciate your willingness to call it homes, though, whether it's rental or home ownership, because another community that I'm working with, I'm pushing them to call them homes, and they um, are insisting that a home is ownership. And um, so they're pushing back, they're saying housing units, which it drives me nuts. And but it's such a bias that they think that if they say homes, that that the people in the community will actually feel um, like they were lied to if they support rental housing because they see homes as ownership. It, it's really fascinating. So do you have a sense, Grover, how you might name that? Where? Um, I think I just did. I'm on, it's going to take my picture away, but I'm still... I'm just looking at the document. So I would say support the creation of 200 rental or uh -huh. homes, 200 homes language, uh, creation of 200 rental or home ownership. Or just ownership homes, rental or yeah. ownership homes? 200 you, homes. You order, it's maybe easier. Homes for rent or ownership. 200 homes for rent or ownership. Rent or ownership that are affordable to people earning below 100% AMI over the next five years. 
Yeah, that was relevant. Okay, so 200 homes for rent or ownership affordable to people earning below 100% AMI over the next five years. Yep. Sounds great. Do Does anyone have any other thoughts or opposition or? Carol, did you want to say something? Um, I, I just at the same time, sort of that Grover, Wait a minute. At the same time, sort of that Grover said what they said, I noticed for the first time that it didn't have anything about um, rental in it. And so I'm just, yeah, I'm glad that it now does. That's all. So you had formally accepted this goal in the past as it was before. Do you need to formally do something again to modify it? I don't know. I don't think so. I think in the end, when it's all an action plan, then we can accept it once the whole action plan is complete. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So at this point, do people feel comfortable with the modified, now the modified goal naming uh, rental and the five strategies that have been developed? Does it feel doable and you can feel comfortable with it? I, I have a question that I just would like before we move on. And I imagine next time we'll talk about a different goal. And it's just that, so, cause I wasn't in the committee. Is there someone on the committee who is just really psyched about point E? Cause like we talked about, um, <laughs> you know, we talked about this in some ways laying out our goals, but also the way in which we will all hopefully be actively participating in reaching some point of the goal. So I'm curious if somebody, it was Gaston. I, well, I'm, I, I'm not on the committee, but I'm excited okay. about um, ex that exploration. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you. Greg. Greg. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Shelly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will take some amount of, of, of credit slash blame for, for dropping that into the mix or some of that into the mix, um, you know, and I, and I can offer some more context too, if that'd be helpful. Um, I guess I will, <laughs> you know, but just basically, I, yeah, I'll say certainly that Grover, your points about the logistics of this kind of a thing are absolutely vital and like, you know, and, and I, there's, there's a lot of imagination and exploration to do before it would be in my mind sensible to commit to anything. The specific, I, I had a few sort of disparate ideas and I won't babble on too much, but the one thing I was thinking, you know, I, not so much that it has to be revolving loan funds so much as some small portion of our resources and efforts aimed at more innovative, you know, sort of potential to scale, affect the ecosystem, um, introduce new actors into the ecosystem, et cetera, you know, and, and that was maybe one back of the envelope idea about it. And I think the reason I, I might have surfaced that idea too was just thinking about, um, the interesting part about like something like a, like a, a loan fund as opposed to straight investments is it's possible to get external investment into such vehicles. For example, a large private college with a significant endowment, you know, colleges do invest in funds like this sometimes, you know, some context. Well, that, well that's interesting context. I, the like um, housing narrative person in me, my, uh, desire us for shifting that around to really emphasize the goal that you named of innovations that can scale um, more so than the excitement one might have over a loan fund, which can be exciting, but like for the sake of what? Because the way I read it now is like, okay, we're going to take some of our team energy where we're trying to like you know, I'm the throwing elbows metaphor is still here of like 200 units, let's go. Um, take some portion of the energy being like, how do loan repayments work? Um, and, but for the sake of what you're saying, for the sake of potentially scaling something really innovative and that might have, for example, a different funding, an, um, an innovative funding stream even. So that's interesting. So I guess I would... 
requests like flipping the the words a little bit like uh more on the innovation and less on new the... can explore innovative approaches to supporting the construction of affordable housing including possibly the establishment of a revolving loan fund something like that uh might be what i would recommend uh, to your comment about the a college wanting to invest in a fund um turns out that somebody i practice law very closely with is a new uh chair of the board of amherst college yeah. <laughs> and if I could just say, um, definitely innovative. We've been talking about uh, tiny homes for a very long time. And all I've heard from Paul, uh, who is not against it, but he said it's not efficient in terms of funding. So to have a pilot where we could actually try something like that and not just use a monetary value as valuable um, it might be absolutely worth looking into. So definitely, I think this is really exciting. So our little, our um, small group, what, what I can't think of what we're calling it, is actually meeting tomorrow. So why don't we put it on our agenda to, to flush that out a little bit more and maybe bring it back next time. So we do have some strategies for the other goals, but there are some details that we're trying to get a little bit more information on to feel a little bit more comfortable presenting to you. So that's just why we have decided to um, just start with the one goal now. So I, I think that it sounds good that we're, uh, seems like we're heading in a similar direction and we'll do a little bit more work tomorrow on E and hopefully firm up the other ones. Hopefully we'll do that so that the next meeting um, perhaps we'll be able to, to, to go through the rest of the strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. We really appreciate it. Great to be here. All right. Thanks so much. Bob presented at our housing, uh, Institute yesterday. It was fantastic on the land trust in Amherst. Ah, <laughs> all right. Thanks okay. so much. Have a nice evening, Shelly. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Shelly. So, we're going to move to uh, item number six. I'm going to start with member outreach first. Um, so uh, there was a question uh, or a comment that we actually might have one of our vacancies filled. Um, and what we have found out is that the town council has approved as of June 3rd, Alex Cox. Um, we had the opportunity to, we mean Carol, myself and Nate had the opportunity to interview Alex Cox. He came highly recommended by, uh, Paul, uh, Buckelman. Um, he had worked with Alex on some other, um, uh, projects and, uh, thought he would be a very good addition. He's actually a grad student at UMass. So I know we wanted to have a connection with UMass. Um, and we actually had a grad student uh, who then had to uh, step off really quickly from the trust. Um, he has a bachelor's in architecture and um, regional planning, and he's got experience with uh, development companies. And so we're hoping that by our next meeting, we'll have him on board. Um, uh, so I just wanted to add that. And we still have one vacancy. So um, if uh, any of you have members that are, or people that you know in the community, uh, I think it would be really important to talk to them. Um, one of the challenges is that things take, they, they go as fast as molasses <laughs> because we interviewed uh, Alex a long time ago. And so um, I'm, I'm glad that he's still interested. Um, but if you do do outreach, please just let people know that sometimes things take a little while and there's a process. There's the interview, then there's Paul, and then there's the town council that actually approves it. And then there's the swearing in. Um, so just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And if you could definitely do some outreach, that'd be great. Um, the second uh, item here is trust positions. So Carol and I, um, we both have one year left in our term. And uh, besides the fact that we, you know, it's very democratic for a committee to think about uh, the chairperson position, we also thought it'd be really important for us to step down and one, to promote the position and be available as trust members for whatever you know, information we have, uh, any questions that we can provide, 
um, any guidelines that we can provide the new chair. So we actually did outreach to each one of you, and we have one individual who is very, very interested in this position. Um, and I'll let that individual speak for himself. Um, but what we thought would be important is that we um, we probably should take a vote, and we will do that in July, uh, and that will give uh, Carol and me some time to meet with this individual to have a transition plan. So we just don't drop everything in that individual's lap. So um, I want to uh, really, I'm very excited. Um, it is Gaston who is interested in stepping forward. He has stepped forward to say that he's interested. So um, Gaston, I don't know if you want to say a few words or if you have any questions for any of us. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, I, um, I am happy to respond to the call to serve. I've been on the license commission since uh, I moved to Amherst. My term wraps up this summer and I've said I'm not going to renew that. I'd, I'd already done that so I could focus on on the trust. And so uh, I haven't been a chair of one of the town committees and uh, I would you know, welcome the chance to, to try to figure out how to do that well. Thank you, Gaston. So in July, um... We'll just take an official vote. Um, and the only reason we're not doing it tonight is because we don't want to drop everything in your lap, Gaston. We want to give you an opportunity to meet with Carol and me and ask uh, any questions that you have um, and also an opportunity for us to give you some information that we have. Um, and so we'll set up a meeting at your convenience and uh, then in July, we'll do an official vote. Granted that you don't change your mind between now and July. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let me just see if anybody else has any questions or comments. Carol. I would only say, not only do we have one other opening now on the trust, we have three of us, Rob, Erica, and I, who have only one year left. So it's we're gonna need we're gonna need people I'm not immediately, but soon. So keep in the back of your head whoever you know or whoever you can think of who you think might be good. Uh people to join this endeavor. Especially since it takes so long for the process to be complete and get someone on board. So yes, I agree with you, Carol. Let's try to recruit some individuals. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move next to town updates. Uh, and uh, Greg is going to start uh, and give us a little update on a wonderful meeting we had this past Tuesday. Uh, Carol, Gaston, and Grover were able to attend. Um, so, Greg, um, do you want to talk about the VFW meeting with Narrowgate? Sure, yeah, it was Monday, actually, but um, uh, although it feels like it was last night. but <laughs> um, So, yeah, we did a public forum um, with the Narrowgate, which is the architecture firm we're engaged with on a short-term basis to develop some conceptual narratives and plans for the VFW site. Um, so I kind of worked with them to design a meeting that would, um, you know, kind of let people offer, kind of maximize the sort of public input we were able to capture. So we had four different stations, uh, I kind of on four different themes for um, attendees to offer, uh, you know, ideas and feedback. And, um, and you know, I'd say there's about 45 or so folks in there. I have a, I have a science sheet back at my desk at work. Um, but a, a, a sort of robust group, um, kind of not too big, not too small, um, and a lot of you know uh, a lot of positive energy and um, and 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 from where I sat, a lot of very useful useful feedback. Um, you know, uh, I was kind of chairing one of those stations, and the architecture firm had the other three, so I haven't seen their notes yet. But it's but their report was that it was very positive for them as well. So. Um, so yeah, so that was an exciting kickoff of the sort of public feedback portion of that effort. And we'll, um, you know, hopefully have a, like a formal presentation of, of sort of their synthesis of that, of the evening and all their work on the site and their work with different sort of stakeholders one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they'll present a more formal uh, sort of outcome of what they're doing uh, probably end of the summer or early September in, in that window there um, is the target. Thank you, so. Greg. Yeah. 
there will be a follow-up Zoom meeting where they will be presenting that. So um, yeah. it might be easier for others to attend. Uh, this one was an in-person meeting, which was excellent in terms of the numbers. But I also thought what was really wonderful is, is that what they did is they split uh, the topics up into four different areas, the design, the, the architectural design, uh, another topic, shelter versus housing, um, another services, and the last one, belonging. But I think there might have been another piece to it, which I think, Greg, you um, uh uh, sort of led that one. Uh, and it was just really great because of the in-depth sort of wanting to get picking people's you know, experience, brain, lived experiences. Um, Craig's door brought a lot of people with them um, just to, to really think about from a staff perspective, uh, a guest or a resident perspective, uh, and a community perspective of how we want to vision this. So it was pretty exciting. Um, but I'll just open up to see if uh, Gaston, Grover, or Carol have any comments as well. Uh, I just want to say thanks, Greg, for helping plan a really great event. It was, I was really glad I was able to go. I feel like I got to sit down and be in real time conversation with a lot of our community leaders who work most directly with people who are in need of support and um it seemed like a generative space i wish we had had like twice the time to be able to have like some of the deeper conversations but more time in the future it was great i mean i've never seen the town room so bustling with that kind of energy before that was really neat and uh it's also very humbling how long it takes to do a project like this well i mean i think it's five years is the groundbreaking projection, right? Is that roughly? I mean, we put some numbers up there that were intentionally conservative because I, you know, I, I was putting a slide together, frankly, and I, I didn't want to like, you know, opt the whole team into delivering something in 18 months. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'd say, yeah, this is going to be an extended process because it'll have to be an RFP and then whoever wins that RFP will in turn have to do a whole plan and assemble funding and, get through approval. So it'll be, you know, any development like this is a process. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was really enthused though. I mean, there's questions, but um, this is probably not the meeting where people who are deeply opposed are necessarily going to show up to, but I came across nobody that had any, there wasn't really any discussion that I experienced about, should we do this? The discussion was how, um, which was very exciting. I just I thought their approach was I mean that he said at the beginning we were going to have to narrow this eventually but now is not the time for that it's like everything you can think of that you might want and that was kind of just exciting to be able to get to do and to be able to get to do it in these four parts I don't know what's going to happen when it comes time to narrow it down a little bit but but that was really a great experience to have Yeah, it's uh, going through the different topics and then looking at the space. And I've driven past the space a couple of times. I think we need four times that space. <laughs> but it was very interesting. I mean, I think the other um, sort of uh, recommendation was, which I think um, Nate, Greg, and I, we saw that a little bit from um, Father Bills, which was uh, maybe we need to collaborate at other sites that it doesn't all need to be at that site, but there needs to be a bridge to make sure that the individuals at that site feel welcome at other sites. Um, so it's really, really exciting. Um, yeah, can't wait to, to see what, what's next. All right, so then the next is the housing production plan. Sure, and so that, um, uh, we don't have formal updates for the housing production plan, um, but uh, we, uh, it is anticipated that we will sign a contract. Hopefully within within a week, uh, we've got a, um, a vendor identified, um, which we're all excited about. Um, I guess practice is not to name them until we have a formal contract in place. Um, but that's, that's in motion. Um, and, you know, depending on when we can have kind of an internal launch meeting, that might be a great, um, like, like a staff level launch meeting, that might be a great thing for us to, to, to jump on in uh, in June, or certainly July, or sorry, we're in June now, in July um, in our monthly meeting, if there's space for that, you know, for kind of, you know, 
going through the whole process and how the trust can play a role. But I, I do anticipate the trust um, will have the opportunity to kind of be a, a brain trust for that, um, that process, which will be a pretty fleshed out one. Great. Thank you. Any questions about that? Okay. All right, so um, the next item is uh, just um, mentioning the East Gable demographics, which I thought were pretty impressive. Um, I don't know what other people took away, but um, just the, in terms of percentage, 50-50 uh, percentage, they had binary, male, male, female, they didn't have anything else, which I found a little interesting, but age anywhere from 22 to 66, uh, BIPOC 46%, and um, homes uh, preference, 71 local preference and 93% homeless. So those were some of the takeaways that I got, but I thought um, they really, really did a great job of ensuring that uh, the values that they had put out for having um, East Gable is reflected by the demographics. So uh, we just wanted to highlight that and um, we definitely thanked uh, Laura for sharing them, um, but I thought it was pretty impressive and, and they seem to be a really great partner in um, you know, meeting the vision that we also have in terms of uh, addressing the most vulnerable in our community. But we just thought we would open up to see if anybody else had any takeaways from the demographics. I would just say I was very not surprised, but pleased and excited to note that some of the things that people had worried about didn't happen. There are no police calls. There was not a parking problem. There wasn't people somehow being noisy. There were just all of the kinds of things that had been worried about. There was no evidence of any of them having happened. And that was very not surprising, but good to hear. Okay, um, so the next is items not anticipated within 48 hours. Um, what I'd like to do is see if Grace would like to add anything. Um, but before Grace does, um, I just want to state that I, um, I receive, you know, the newsletters from Representative Dom. And in the last newsletter, uh, Representative Dom uh, stated that uh, she secured three million for the third Hampshire district, which included five hundred thousand dollars for the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust for planning for affordable housing with uh, for municipal properties. So it's interesting the language, but it's it's uh, it's it's great. Um, she thought of us, and she really wanted us to have the resources to be able to do some planning. So when I think about that, I think about the exploring number E. Uh, and maybe actually having funds to do some of that. Um, she also put in a million dollars for the Amherst Housing Authority for capital improvement, which is so important because there's existing housing that, you know, the last time we had talked to them, there were 13 vacancies, which is, which is ridiculous, I'm sorry. Uh, and then another million dollars for um, uh, clean energy a modification for the um, Amherst uh, Housing Authority. So really looking out for, um, for this area in terms of ensuring that um, existing housing can be made available to those who need it. Um, so let me just ask Grace if Grace would like to add anything. Go ahead, uh, uh, Greg, can you make Grace a panel? Hi, how's everyone doing? Ooh. Hi, Grace. Go ahead. We can hear you. Or oh, we could. Oh, did Grace disappear? All right, there we are. Hi, how are y'all doing tonight? Good to see you all. Good to um, see you too, Grace. Yeah, so I was just going to include um, exactly what you had said and a little bit more of an overview about some of the big items that were included in the bond bill. Um, so the total authorization of the bill um, that the, the version of the bill that the House put forward was $6.5 billion, um, which is a lot and it's really good. Um, and of that, inclu um, it includes $800 million for the State Affordable Housing Trust Fund, $175 million for Housing Works, which is um, a competitive grant program for municipalities and other entities. Um, uh, 300 million for borrowing for um, 10 opportunity to purchase and it used by right uh, as was mentioned earlier in the meeting which uh, yeah so now uh, it's the bills 
in the hands of Senate Ways and Means. The Senate will take it up. They'll have their opportunity to put forth their own version, then conference committee, and we'll see where it goes from there. But I um, I will keep an eye on everything and provide you with updates as they come. Thank you so much, Grace. We really appreciate it. Of course. Well, thank you all so much. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks. The only sort of not good news is, is it looks like the real estate transfer fee uh, is not getting a, uh, much support, um, but it's not it's not dead yet. It's not sent out the study yet. So we'll see. But it doesn't really look like it's going to go very far. Um, so that's one to keep an eye on. But um, Amherst has its own bylaw that I believe uh, Representative Dom is, is supporting. Um, so. Yeah, so she did file that amendment. Um, it was not included in the final version, unfortunately. But once again, Senate has their opportunity to um, make their own amendments. So we'll see what happens there. And I will keep you all posted on, on all of those specific items as well. Thank you, Grace. So next is public comments. So Grace or Mara, uh, if you have any public comments, um, this is the time you can share with, with us beyond what you just gave us an update. Okay, not seeing Mara's uh, hand up. Um, so it is 8.46 and we're actually at the end of our meeting. Um, our next meeting is July 11th. Uh, as always, our, our uh, meeting link is on the town uh, website uh, on the calendar. Um, but before I close the meeting, any last comments or questions from uh, any of our trust members? Or oh, Greg. Okay, not seeing any hands up. I am going to go ahead and close the meeting officially at 846 and wish everybody a wonderful evening and thank all of you for all of your very valuable input and engagement. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Good thank night. you. Have a good night. Great work. Thanks all. Good night, everybody. Good night, Greg. Good night, Erica. Thank you. <laughs>